Welcome to History 1302. Uh, this is the third in a long series of lectures that gets us from the end of the Civil War to the present time. Uh, the Second Industrial Revolution and Progressive Era, this series of discussions, fits between Western Migration, which we've already discussed, and American Imperialism, which uh, is going to take place at the end of the Progressive Era. Now I want to be clear, there are some overlap between Western Migration uh, the clearing of the plains and etc. and Western Migration and progressivism in the beginning and also the overlap between progressivism and American imperialism at the end of this period which is roughly the 20th century. So we're heading towards 20th century and our main thesis statement in all of progressivism, progressivism is that we have to get the law to catch up with industrialization. If you'll go back to 1301, uh, just before we went into the Civil War, I discussed that a lot, that the, we have a Civil Revolution, but the law has not caught up with that. So we've got about 70 years there between, I don't know, the 18-teens, 1820s, and really 1890s, where uh, we have industrialization, the first and second industrial revolutions, and the law is having a hard time really catching up to that. And a lot had to happen to get the law to catch up with it. So to lay the groundwork for all this, we have to show a lot of stress in our society to get the law, fundamental law, to change. And we'll start with the agricultural industry at the end of the Civil War. Uh, we will take a look at the industry of, or the uh, agriculture of the South, especially. We'll take a look at agriculture in the West. We'll take a look at industry and how industrialization uh, has changed and has been affected by the Civil War. And the changes in industrialization with the second industrial revolution, sort of 1870s, 1880s. Throughout all this, we'll revisit the labor force, especially the poor in the post Civil War era. We'll see the similarities, uh, that is to say, change and uh, the similarities and the change in, in the labor force. Uh, the flip side of the coin, we'll talk about the rich. And there's going to be, because of laissez faire economic policies, there's going to be a huge concentration of wealth in the hands of very, very few people. And we need to take a look at what those people are doing, the industries that are driving that, the changes in industry that are driving that, and what then is the stress because of that concentration of wealth in the hands of the rich. We'll take a look at the effect of immigration, wave after wave after wave of new people uh, coming into America, mostly as stress relief, in other words, escape from Europe. There's going to be a lot of upheaval in Europe, and people are going to want to escape that, and they're coming to America for that. Again, we've talked about that in Western Migration. We will revisit that. To be clear, these immigrants are going to have a high expectation of a better life for themselves in America, and those expectations are not going to be met. And so, again, this is added stress. We'll take a look at the middle class. This is going to be the dynamic of change. This is where change is actually going to come from. As it turns out, in American history, we've discovered many, many times, the poor really have no meaningful political voice. And the rich, at the other end of the scale, don't make up enough numbers to really make a big difference in a democracy. So it's the middle class who are going to be the dynamic of change, and we'll have to take a look at that. A lot of stress is going to be on the middle class, and they're going to demand change. As it turns out, they're going to get it. Finally, we'll take a look at the political ramifications, and we'll take a look at the next step which is Imperial America. In other words, uh, we have the dynamo that's going on, uh, and, and as we go into the 20th century, uh, the outgrowth will be an expansion of American values, uh, an expansion of American uh, political influence outside the United States, and it's going to be Imperial America. So with that outline uh, sort of in mind, uh, let's continue on uh, with... Um, Let's take a look at the southern economy and the economy of agriculture. When we take a look at the agricultural economy, especially of the south, and I'll talk about the west here in just a few moments, um, we talk about basically this is after the south has been rebuilt in the post-Civil War era. So this is not an overnight event. It's going to take, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, well into the 1880s. We talked about this before in Western Migration and Reconstruction. Uh, real rebuilding of the southern economy doesn't really start taking place until the mid-1870s. 
But when it does, you have an event called the New South, and your book will talk about that a lot. So the New South, first off, a lot of people have left the South. And the people who were there, especially after the 1870s, 1880s, they turned to a series of cash crops. And these are crops that have always been good crops from the South, cotton, tobacco, and sugar. Uh, the saying was at the time, cotton was king, but sugar was imperial. And so these crops that we've run into many, many times before, they are only going to be growing in the South. You don't get cotton any farther north than, say, um, central Texas, really, all the way through the lower um, the deep south, that is to say. Cotton can't grow any farther north, north than that with those older varieties of cotton. Modern varieties can grow quite a, considerably further north, well into Kansas. Tobacco, only in, the west, only in the far east of the United States and only in the south. The growing season, the soil, the temperature, the water, that's only conducive to tobacco in the south. Now again, on tobacco, just let me point out that we don't, today we have a strong aversion to tobacco. But that's only beginning really in the 1970s. It came on strong in the 1980s. Before that, uh, commercial tobacco was strongly uh, s compelled as a market force throughout America and, and basically throughout the world uh, by the tobacco companies. They really, really did push this product really hard. And so there's a huge worldwide market for tobacco. And still, it's only really going to grow uh, in the southern states, maybe a few places in the Caribbean, and there's a few other places in the world, but it's only really going to grow uh, in the southern states, so you have a global market. And so tobacco is going to be a big, big cash crop for the south. Last but not least, of course, is sugar. Uh, we've talked about this many, many times before. Sort of um, coastal Texas, uh, parts of southern Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and especially South Florida, all going to be big sugar producers. Um, Texas probably doesn't get enough credit for that. Uh, well into the 20th century, sugar is going to be imperial here in Texas. So these are going to be the big cash crops in the South. What I want you to really get out of this is that these are cash crops that become really industrialized. In other words, um, and I'll talk about this really in the next slide, um, equipment companies that produce equipment for agriculture are really going to come on strong in the post-Civil War era. There's going to be a lot of inventions that allow the individual farmer to increase productivity through the use of machines. And this is really, really inc uh, incredibly important because you have cotton, tobacco, and sugar. As it took, you know, hundreds of people before to get those crops in the ground and then harvested and processed, not only takes tens to have a greater productivity. You only have tens or twenties of people that had to do the work of hundreds more. And so labor costs go way down and productivity goes way back up. And so in the South especially, cotton, tobacco, and sugar cannot be overstated as tremendous cash crops for the South. Huge cash injection. Not because those crops weren't there before, but because the productivity is increasing through industrialization. So with that in mind, let's talk about that same dynamic, but apply it to West, which is now coming online as the Native Americans are pushed out. Okay, in this slide, what I want to do is discuss the agriculture that's taking place West. As we've discussed before uh, in um, Western migration, um, the... West is becoming greatly populated as the Native Americans are being forced off the land. This is a matter of manifest destiny, and we've talked about that many, many times before. Add to that the Homestead Act of 1862, which allows people to go to the West, and we've talked before, uh, stake out some claim on the land. Uh, the, the amount of land change over time. Usually it's 188. As soon as you put an improvement on it, and then it's your land. And so we have lots and lots and lots of farmers heading West either out of the south, and we've talked about that before, or out of the northeast, the Ohio River Lane, we've talked about that. They're settling in the west, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, um, Oklahoma, Texas, there's all sorts of places that they're settling in the west, and they're beginning to break out the land. Now, if you'll take a look at the image, you'll see that John Deere Plow, 1840s in the upper right, 
Well, this is a sort of a plow that had been available to farmers since time immemorial. In other words, particular design uh, goes back a thousand years. In the post-Civil War era, with all the industrial productivity that's going on, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a few moments, um, two men in particular, John Deere, which was a, an, an actual inventor, and then later the John Deere Company, and another man named Cyrus McCormick, Cyrus McCormick, C-Y-R-U-S, McCormick. These two guys are going to be really, really responsible for inventing agricultural equipment. And this agricultural equipment are going to be force multipliers. That is to say, one farmer can now do the work of many because of these tools and these equipment. And so uh, there you have on the upper left image, uh, one mule, and a, uh, I'm sorry, five mules and a one horse team in Haskell County, Texas in the 1890s. So the farmer is sitting on a machine that is designed to like really, really turn up the soil and turn over the soil and do the agricultural work. In that lower illustration, you can see one farmer sitting on, you know, a seat with all sorts of levers and bars and foot pedals. Uh, he can control that mower. So this is sort of a harvesting machine. You have two horses, the wheels turn, uh, those in turn, they're dragging this piece of equipment and that turns the wheels. The wheels turn gears, worm gears and spinners, and the farmer, using those levers and actually foot pedals, can control the height of the cutting blade that you can see extended out there. And so one farmer with two horses can harvest a crop that took hundreds of men with scythes it took hundreds of men to do just 20 years earlier. Then he can come back, take his horse team off of that piece of equipment, put the horses on another piece of equipment that gathers all the wheat crop or grain crop up, then take that all to, you know, some place where it can all be thrashed. Therefore, these farmers can produce a, a vast amount of agricultural output with much, much less effort. These are four small plants. John Deere, Cyrus McCormick, or others, but those are the two main ones, who are inventing and producing all of this equipment and selling it to these farmers, and that vastly increases agricultural output. Now, this has a very serious knock-on economic effect, and what I'm trying to draw your attention to here is the stress within our society. But the stress is basically economic. In other words, it's industrial, so I'm going to use economic language here. So we have land that is basically being given to the farmers. In other words, their basic startup cost is virtually zero. They may have to go into hawk a little bit to buy all this equipment, but their basic startup cost, the land, was virtually zero. They're farmers, so they want to produce, 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 and this equipment allows them to produce a great deal of agricultural output. Now their target market is not in the West. Their target market is in the cities of the East. And again, we'll talk about that later on. We have this tremendous growth of cities. Well, obviously people in cities cannot grow their own produce. They can't grow their own beef. So these farmers are producing, 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 producing for their target markets in the cities in the East. Philadelphia and New York, Boston, uh, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Illinois, St. Louis, Missouri. All these big giant cities are just exploding in the East. That is your target market for the produce. So they're producing like mad, but ironically, that means that the price of the product goes down because all of these farmers are producing like mad, the price of their product goes down. Transportation costs kind of stay the same, and we'll get to that a little bit later on. But the price of the product goes down because there's so much productivity out there. So the farmers, please take a strong note of this, farm all the harder. They break out more land. They put more land in production. They go into debt just a little bit to get even more equipment to increase productivity. So productivity increased. The price of the product, the, the, the profit that they're getting from the product goes down again. And so, ironically, again, the farmers produce more. Now, to modern economists, to people that uh, think about this, and we kind of have the luxury of thinking about this sort of thing in the classroom environment, the immediate idea is, well, why don't these farmers pull together as a team then and then actually decrease productivity? 
Well, as it turns out, Farmer's Time knew that too, and we will discuss that later on. But here's the deal. If all the farmers in a big giant region pulled together as a team, formed cooperative, as they will, and said, listen, what we're going to do is all of us together will decrease productivity by 15 or 20 percent. Then the price of our products will go up. The practical application that, of that fails because an individual farmer will say, well, what will happen is all these other, all my farmer buddies, they'll decrease productivity, but I will keep my personal productivity the same. Then when the price of the product goes down, I'll be able to sell my product and I'll have a lot up at a higher market price. Therefore, I'll make money. So what actually happens is all of the farmers fear that the other guy will do that. In other words, keep his productivity the same in hopes of getting a windfall profit. And so they all produce the same or increase productivity. They can't seem to pull together as a meaningful team. So productivity of the years just goes up and up and up and up as more farmers break out more land through the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s and increase more and more and more productivity. It drives the price of the products further and further and further down. The farmers can't seem to make any money and they can't pull together as a meaningful team. And so here they are with a tremendous amount of land, some little bit of debt because they had to buy all this farm equipment, tremendous productivity and they're starving death. They're basically they can't make any money at all. They can't get ahead economically. So again what I'm driving at here is not the economic problem, it's the stress in society that the economic problem brings on. So all the farmers, well as vast treasure of land and all this tremendous productivity feel they're being shortchanged. And that's a stress in society. Now again, uh, to go in this kind of full circle, we're talking about um, productivity in the West, the area west of the Mississippi. This has never been an area that's had any meaningful political voice in our national politics up to the 1870s, 1880s. But because all this land is being broken out and all those farmers are moving out to the West, the land prices are going up because they've all been improved and the farmers are doing all this work, they begin to exert a lot of political voice. And this is new in American politics. It's an outgrowth of West migration. So with that in mind, let's go to another aspect of Western agriculture that becomes industrialized and how that turns into a sort of a stressor. Culture, and we're going to apply this to um, beef production uh, in the post-Civil War era. Now, as you can imagine, a lot of uh, overlap between what's going on uh, here on the slide and, uh, and um, Western migration. In other words, we've still got to push all those Native Americans off the land before we can get control of beef production entirely. So we're talking about the late 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and heading kind of into the 20th century. So first, let's start with uh, the map. And if you look, all those green lines going kind of north, south to north, we're talking about beef production starting out really in South Texas. And today just don't think about these things. So let me kind of point this out. This is long before there was any sort of barbed wire. Barbed wire had not been developed yet uh, because uh, inexpensive steel production had been developed yet. So there's no way down there to uh, pan the cattle in. They're all free range. You can't build wooden fences in a vast, vast, vast area that is kind of southern Texas. We don't talk about uh, free-range beef further north because that's all buffalo country. So here are hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of range beef cattle in sort of South Texas. So let's talk, talk then, I think we want to try and apply economic language to this kind of get-rich-quick scheme. So uh, you have guys like uh, Brisbane, who's not really that big of a beef baron. We think of Colonel Goodnight and some of these other guys as big beef barons. But he's pointing out in this book in the 1880s, uh, as you can see from the title there, The Beef Bands of Ore, How to Get Rich on the Plains. Well, he's showing how this is going to be done. The guys who have to do this, again, Colonel Goodnight and some of these other guys. Go down to South Texas, where there's a lot of free-range beef. Hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of head of them. Have your cowboys go down there and simply round them up. 
They're free range. They don't belong to anyone. So to be clear, your initial cost is zero. You're paying your cowboys and beans and beef on the hoof. You tell your cows, listen, if you're hungry, knock some cow on the head and eat it, okay? Or just take cheap, cheap, cheap food, and that's what you feed your cowboys on. They get all these cattle all gathered up in these big, giant herds. You cull out any cattle that happen to have a brand on them, and then you simply start moving them north. Now, shockingly, cattle eat grass, and as it turns out, they have four legs so they can move themselves. So now your transportation cost and is basically zero. So you herd cattle for two or three days, let them graze for a day or two. Herd them two or three days, let them graze for a day or two. And you're heading up to the railroads and the railheads in Kansas. This is after the railroads have gone, or, or as the railroads are heading west, which is in the 1860s, 1870s, and you get them up to Abilene or Dodge City or wherever it is you're going to go. Then these cattle are then sold to the railroads. So economically, your cost was virtually zero. Your transportation cost was virtually zero. You negotiate with the railroads who are buying the cattle. And you say, listen, you know, I want two, $5 a head. And they'll negotiate you down to four. Okay, fine. However much it is you get for that five, six, seven, eight hundred head of cattle, all that is basically clear profit. You pay off your cowboys a little bit. They might have made, you know, a dollar a day, something like that. And you pay them off a little bit, and then they all go out and get drunk, and then tell them, look, you're going to be down in San Antonio or someplace next season and do this all over again. Well, that's on for almost 20 or 30 years. But let's follow the product. So the railroads get control of the cattle, and they know that the target market is back east in Chicago or New York or Boston, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the big steel towns where the workers cannot grow their own food. That's your target market. Well, the railroads have control of the railroad. In other words, they're not going to charge themselves overtly for transportation costs. They have the cars, they have the locomotives, they already have the engineers. So they simply tell the people managing the track, clear the track of passenger service and freight service because all the cattle trains are going west. So you started on Abilene or Dodge City or someplace, and you started moving all this traffic east, and it only takes a couple of days to get to Boston, to get to New York, to get to Chicago, to get to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to get to Washington, D.C., or Philadelphia, any one of these burgeoning cities in the east. And that's your target market. So your transportation cost, even for the railroads, your startup cost was negligible. Your transportation cost was virtually zero, and you pass all that cost along to your target market. So a, a cow, a head of beef in Abilene that costs you two dollars fifty three dollars a head, it costs you virtually nothing to transport. You're charging ten or fifteen dollars for that same cow in Philadelphia, in Boston, in New York City, in Chicago. So the railroads are going to make a vast treasure of money transporting cattle for themselves. The butcher will say, listen, I'm going to buy power of that cow or the other cow and for his target market. And he's going to butcher the thing. And then by parting it all out, he's going to pass that cost right along to the consumer. So you're going to be able to get inexpensive, fairly good quality beef in one of these big cities. And you're going to be able to get that inexpensively. But just remember now, the, the profit, in other words, that part of the profit, did not get passed along to that cowboy. It didn't get passed along to the bottom. Now, by the 1890s or so, barbed wire will become ex uh, inexpensive and readily available. And so this sort of dynamic begins to die down. But beef production in the West becomes industrialized. And so it can be a get-rich-quick scheme for a lot of people. One last chance of this dynamic, as, again, the buffalo hunted out in the 1880s, 1890s, cattle production moves up into the Oklahoma Territory, up into Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, Wyoming. Uh, in other words, um, cattle barons begin pushing cattle production farther and farther and farther north as the buffalo are exterminated. And so, 
another element of this is the railroads are going to start pushing railroads down to Dallas and Fort Worth, uh, down into uh, South Texas, into uh, Fort Stockton, and uh, on further down to San Antonio. And so these cattle drives, by the 1890s, th that's all over with. But beef production is going to remain high because you still have these giant cities growing in the east, and they have an insatiable desire for um, high-impact high um, meat products like beef. It's just going to become industrialized, and we'll talk about that more later on as uh, we are talking about the guys that are really, really getting rich off of beef production. So the idea here is something as basic agriculture, as a basic and agricultural product as beef, becomes industrialized. But the guys that are doing all the work, the cowboy, he still makes no money. Money can be made. It's just not by the guys lowest down on, on the food chain. Okay? So with that in mind, let's uh, take another look at uh, industrialization, that is to say, the industrial workforce, the traditional industrial workforce, and let's see what, what changes have taken place in the post-Civil War era for them. And that will be the next slide. <laughs> All right, on this slide, what I really want to do, and it's going to take us some time to get through this, so just kind of settle in here. What I really want to do is take a look back east at that economy in the post-Civil War era. Now, our basic thesis is, as you can see, the law is not cut up with industrialization. And we kind of, this industrialization, this industrial revolution, really began uh, 18-teens, late 18-teens, 1820s, with the widespread introduction and the perfection of the steam engine. Now, before that, the law had been based on an agriculturally based economy. And that law had gone back through uh, European and American history for hundreds and hundreds of years. Because it's an agriculturally based economy, you have farmers that are basically tied to the land. And everybody can see the agricultural output. They can see whether it's going to be a good year or a bad year. And they know where they can find the farmer. He's out there on the farm. And so you can kind of make a business deal on a handshake. The farmer's not going to go anywhere, the crops aren't going to go anywhere, the land's not going to go anywhere. So everybody kind of knows one another and you can make a deal based on your word. But when industrialization comes along based on the steam engine, a dynamic emerges that was really unexpected. And this is a mobile workforce. You have people that get into a factory setting, off the farm and into a factory setting, and you have this mobile workforce. In other words, they, uh, the workforce itself can be hired and fired. Um, the factories can open and close. You have a lot of market forces that deal with industrialization that are really genuinely dynamic. And so this sparks a movement towards contracts. It's all about the contract. And it took forever for the law to like kind of catch up to that. At first, the factory owners had a tremendous advantage over the workers, and the workers couldn't band together. There was a labor surplus in Europe and in America, and again, we're still talking about the pre-Civil War era. And so the workers find themselves at a tremendous disadvantage, and the law is not moved to protect them. In Europe, this starts to happen kind of 1840s, 1850s. But it still takes a long time for the law, even in Europe, to catch up with industrialization. In America, this industrialization really took place, uh, again, uh, right after the uh, War of 1812, so 1810s, 18 18-teens. But the law doesn't really catch up to industrialization until well after the Civil War, really the 1890. So for about, I don't know, 40 years there, 50 years, wages did not move. You can have children in the labor force, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and a child might be paid 50 cents an hour, I'm sorry, 50 cents a day. And women were in the workforce, and there's no limitation on that, and they'd be paid a dollar a day. Men would be in the labor force, obviously, and they're going to be paid maybe a dollar fifty or two dollars a day. And that labor, that compensation for labor, that money for labor, that, that wage rate did not change for nearly 40 years. As a man, you might be paid the same in the 1870s or 1880s as you were in the 1810s and 1820s without regard to cost of living increases or inflation or anything of that nature because 
labor was contract. And so if you didn't like what was going on, you could just quit. And many people did. Or face starvation. And many people did. So labor could always, in other words, labor was being stomped on by management. It's just the way it was. Because the law had not caught up. Now the Civil War takes place, 1860 to 1865, and manufacturing went crazy in support of the war. As I've pointed out, a Lincoln was spending perhaps a, as much as a million dollars a day on the war effort. So let's take a picture of the, let's take a look at this uh, um, photograph in the upper left. You can see there are a whole line of guns, but let's turn that into an uh, an economic reality. In other words, with all those cannons there, that's a lot of steel. And that meant a lot of men out there in the mines digging up iron ore to turn that into iron and then turn that later on into steel. It took a lot of engineers and cannon designers to turn those into actual guns. It took metallurgists to get the chemistry just exactly right so the gun wouldn't blow up or be too heavy or be too light. You had to have lots and lots of training for all those gunners there that you see. All those gunners had to have uniforms, as you can see. So that took a lot of cotton manufacture, dye manufacture. So when we talk about the war effort, think of all the shoes, uniforms, belt buckles. Think of all the guns, all the ammunition, all the gunpowder. Think of all the pay for all the soldiers. And all those people are making a lot of money, and they spent the money that they made. So as it turns out, a war can actually be a big boost to the economy. But in the post-war era, typically, typically in a post-war era, you suffer a tremendous depression. The typical reaction to the end of a war economically is a depression because the state cancels all the contracts. So again, let's follow that for just a moment. If you had, if Lincoln, or uh, as it were, Ed Johnson, had a huge contract for all these cannons in support of the war, and then the war came to an end, the Johnson administration had to cancel all those contracts. Think upstream from the cannon manufacturer. He had contracts for metal, and he had contracts with engineers, and he had contracts with metallurgists, and he had contracts with coal miners for, uh, to, to provide the fuel to smelt out all the cannons and do all the manufacturing. Well, those canceled. All of that had to be canceled. So all the coal miners would be put on furlough. All the iron ore manufacturing would be put on furlough. All the cotton guys that did uniforms, they would be put on furlough. All the guys doing, say, for instance, uh, indigo dye for blue uniforms, they would be put on furlough. Well, that would create then a depression in the post-war era. That's typically what would happen. But as it turns out, in post -World War, the post-Civil War era in America, we did not have that. I don't want you to confuse this with the ups and downs that would normally happen in the economy because we had a do boom and bust economy. That's laissez-faire, and we'll talk about that later on. But there was not really a, a measurable depression in the post-Civil War era because of the end of the war. What actually happens is that the manufacturing capability stays way up, the output stays up, in support of, in other words, uh, the, the, uh, instead of building cannons, we're building, we're making steam for steam locomotives because of the expansion of railroads in the West, the reproduction or the reconstruction, the rebuilding of railroads in the South. So steel production stays up. We just change products. One of the outgrowths of the Civil War and I've discussed this with you before, one of the outgrowths of the Civil War was the standardization of clothing. Well, think of Western migration. People would usually make all the clothing for themselves, but in Western migration, we had all those people moving west, but there's no productivity, no manufacturing capability in the west. So even if you wanted cloth to make clothes on your own initiative in the west, that cloth still had to be manufactured in the East and shipped West. But as it turns out, people began to get used to have manufactured clothing. And so that clothing is all manufactured in the East, and your target market is suddenly all those people out there in the West. So we're not making uniforms for all those soldiers anymore, but we're making manufactured clothing for all the people who have moved West. 
They have no productivity, no cotton manufacturing, no clothing manufacturing in the West. So they have a high demand for those products in the East. Therefore, productivity stayed high in the East. The law still has not caught up with industrialization. So we're putting a vast treasure of people into those manufacturing um, elements, those manufacturing uh, um, economies, but we're still paying them really, really, really low. Demand is really, really high. Profitability for these corporations is going to be really, really, really high because labor loss is really, really, really low. So productivity just goes crazy. Demand is crazy. The price people will pay for those products is really outrageous. But the labor costs are very, very low. That dynamic started before the Civil War and continuing through the Civil War and now in the post-Civil War era into the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, that continues on. So we have manufacturing increase in many, many different industries, but the worker is still being stomped on. So this creates a stress in our society. All of those workers see a vast treasure of money being made and they understand that uh, the demand is there for all their products, but they are personally being maltreated in the workplace, as the next couple of slides will show, and they're being paid extremely poorly. So post-Civil War era, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, productivity increases dramatically. The demand for products, not military products anymore, but products for the civilian market dr dramatically increases. But because the law is not caught up with industrialization, the worker is just getting crushed. So let's move on and see how the worker is actually being treated and figure out you know, what the stress in society is still all about. What we're taking a look at here is again the exploitation that most um, management exploited their, are exhibiting to labor force. They're exploiting the labor force. And our thesis, again, is that the law is not caught up with industrialization. That was the previous few slides. So what we're really looking at now in the progress era is the stress that's going on in our society. And it had been going on since the 1830s, 1840s. So really, the images that you see here really tell the story. This is what I'm really driving at here. Uh, in the upper left, we see a, a photograph. And again, I've seen the first half, of, if you've seen the uh, 1301 part. I actually used this photograph before. It's one of my favorites. But you can see that these are young ladies who are in the workforce. And perhaps the average age there, 11, 12, 13 years of age. Uh, second photograph there on the top, uh, so sort of upper right. These happen to be um, workers shelling clams and oysters and canning them in a factory in the east. And so again, this is just being industrialized. You've got to feed the masses. So a harvest comes in off the ship. They put all these mussels and oysters uh, in these big giant troughs. And everybody just gets to shun out oysters. Well, again, there's something wrong with this photograph. You see children of virtually all ages in this photograph. Uh, you can see this young lady standing on a plank over over that you know that trough, and and she can't be more than six or seven, eight years old. Young men with aprons that go all the way to the floor. Uh, mother standing there, but has to have her child with her at work. There's no daycare center, no kindergartens. These children are not in school. You see on the lower left, uh, a very young fellow trying to man manage one of these um, uh, spools in a cotton in a garment factory sort of thing. They're setting up cotton into cloth, and he can't be more than five or six years old, and yet he's already in a factory setting. In the lower right, uh, these are young men probably in the logging industry or pa perhaps in coal mining industry, and they are industrial workers. You can see they've got their little lunch pails. They may be getting ready to go down into the mines, and um, they're, they're workers. So we can exploit child labor. The law is not caught up with industrialization. And again, these children are not in school. So we see from report after report, um, uh, activist after, after activist points out that because these children are caught up in the labor force so young, their education fails. Therefore, they grow up illiterate and they have no choice but to remain at the lowest levels 
of our economic workforce. And then their children are probably going to be forced to go into labor at a very young age, miss out on any kind of an education, and their children, this is just going to be self-perpetuating, their children will then be in the same dilemma. Furthermore, you can't help but understand that this is a very unhealthy environment for those children to be working in. So by the age, especially if you're a young man and you're going down in the mines as a kid, uh, your health is going to be wrecked by the time you're in the 20s or 30s. And so your life expectancy is very short and very brutal. Uh, you can imagine a young man like this, and me is the report that talked about this. You work in the garment factory or in the, in the um, cotton manufacturing industry. You breathe in all this cotton fiber. And so by the age of 20, you breathe in a whole lot of cotton fiber, and your lungs are just wrecked up. Women who are having to spend their, you know, all their young adult life on their feet in a factory setting, uh, this gives them all sorts of, you know, bone diseases. And later on, when they're trying to do, uh, when they're in their childbearing years, they have a lot of difficulty with that. So there's this huge knock-on effect. And again, labor, uh, the price that we're paying for labor, children, 50 cents a day, young ladies, maybe a, a, a dollar a day, uh, men, a dollar fifty a day. Uh, the price for labor has changed in 30, 40, 50 years. Cost of living may have gone up. Their um, food might have gone up. Clothing might have gone up. But their pay is not going up. So this is a huge stress in society. Not on one or two levels, but on many levels. Uh, the work is very difficult. And again, uh, we're just exploiting this labor force because the law is not cut off with industrialization. And the whole point of the Progressive Era, again as a reminder, is to show you that the law will in fact catch up with industrialization. All right? So all of these uh, people are being exploited for their work, and we have a labor surplus in America, so there's just no outlet for the stressor. All right? So on that note, let's go on to the next slide and talk about continuing stress, this growing stress in America, based really on the concentration of our labor, especially in the East, in these big cities. Adding to that, an overlayer of new immigrants, and we've talked about that before, but we need to talk about that again. So let's continue to talk about this stress that's going on uh, in American society in the progressive, in the post so era, in the progressive era. Okay, let's continue on to about the stress that's going on within our uh, American society, and this is going to be the driver of tra change later on. We've got to get the law to catch up with industrialization. So the photographs really tell the story. So let me kind of put this into the right perspective. What you're looking at on the photograph on the left, uh, the photographer is at one end of Mulberry Street, and he's shooting up, and you can see in the far distance, Mulberry Bend. And the second photograph, you can see these puppies' camera gone all the way down to Mulberry Bend, and he's kind of shooting back uh, the direction that he came from. So what I want you guys to get out of this is how are in cities, People are being just jammed in, and this is a new event in the post-Civil War era. Uh, New York City going into the Civil War, maybe a few tens of thousands of people, uh, not that big of a city. In other words, uh, we're only talking about the very southern tip of Long Island. That's all that New York City was. The big bridges that go across to New Jersey and Newark, those had not been done yet. Certainly the tunnels that go across, those are all late 20th century. So when we talk about New York City, it was actually the only way you could get back and forth to New York City was by ferry. And there was sort of an artificial restriction on the size of the city. But in the post-Civil War era, the ferry business booms because steamships are readily available, and we start having also bridges getting back and forth across uh, the East River and the Hudson River, and so you have this giant boom in New York City. Add to that huge immigration population and a demand for manufactured goods and expensive manufactured goods. So back to the photographs. Now there's more to these photographs that meet the eye and I hope that I'm giving you guys some really good evidence. First let's kind of take a look at the architecture. And if you count the number of floors on any one of these buildings in New York City, we know this is New York City because the photographer tells us that. The highest building that you kind of see in this photograph is about six stories. Well, this is supposed to be sort of downtown New York City. 
And today, we think of um, New York City as very vertical. There's a lot of verticality, verticality, and people lived in really, really tall buildings, and that's what New York should be like. That all lie in the future. Here we are in the 1880s, and all, that, all those big, tall buildings lie in the future. The reason why you can't have a building more than five or six stories tall, no elevators. That had not been invented yet. The idea was there, but the electric motor and electricity to run those motors has not developed yet. So that's the 1890s, 1910s, 19-teens. So to get up to the fifth or th sixth floor, you had to walk up all those stairs. Well, carrying any kind of groceries, carrying any kind of product up and down those stairs, it's just not going to work. You can't go above about the sixth floor. Now, to be clear, because some of you may be thinking, well, the engineering simply wasn't there. No, the engineering was there. Think of the Capitol Dome. That had been begun before the Civil War. So the ability to build higher than five or six floors, that was there. That had already been plainly exhibited. But you just can't have people living that high up. Furthermore, let's take a look at the, the action that's going on the street, and there's a lot of action there. If you look carefully, you'll see that there's a lot of produce going on in the streets. Well, obviously, all that produce had to be shipped in from someplace else. You have to feed your workforce. So there's stall after stall after stall after stall of produce in the cities. But as we pointed out in the previous slide, the farmer's not getting that money. He's overproducing, 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 and it's going here, do you see, where you see it here, at the point of sale. And people are buying that because that's where they live. So what's sustaining the economy here? Well, it's small manufacturing. So again, back to the photograph. You can see that there's no automobiles. Why no automobiles? They haven't been invented yet. The automobile has not been invented yet. When these photographs were taken, the automobile was still 10 or 20 years in the future, and widespread use was 30 years on. Furthermore, there's no meaningful public transportation. There were buses available called omnibuses, but they were horse-drawn, a big giant wagon that would carry people. So you're still only moving at the pace of a horse. And a horse, if you can imagine a wagon trying to get through that crowded mess, a horse-drawn wagon, just no way. So there's not a whole lot of omnibus use. So manufacturing had to be down on those ground floors or in piecework, which is kind of going to be the, uh, um, the next slide. And the workers had to be where the factories are at. They couldn't commute back and forth to work. So you're packing more and more and more and more people into a tighter and tighter and tighter space. This leads to, in other words, this has a knock-on effect. There's no meaningful plumbing. There's no meaningful sanitation. So, in other words, the toilet, the flush toilet, had not been invented yet. So, if you have all these people in this really, really tight area with no meaningful plumbing, okay, uh, that's going to lead to disease. It's going to lead to really disgusting odors, and everybody knew that was bad. In any one of these houses, any one of these tenement settings, if you needed to use the bathroom, you went to a chamber pot, literally a pot in the house. You took care of your business, and then you opened up a window and basically weaned it out. Or at best, you took it downstairs to a plumbing outlet and simply poured it in, and it went, ran into the East River. So we're talking about very crude sanitation. We're talking about people just being packed in and packed in and packed in in an ever tighter situation. So, stress is increasing among the population. Add to that, all these immigrants are coming in, they need a place to stay, they need a job, and so there's an easy way to exploit labor. And again, I'll get to that in just a minute. So, New York City is burgeoning, it's growing with small manufacturing. But people are being packed in ever, ever tighter, and they're not being paid anything at all. This is a huge stress in society because the law is not caught up in the industrialization. So with all this in mind, and again, your book will talk about this uh, in, in tremendous detail, uh, let me, uh, allow me to kind of give you guys a story to uh, uh, illustrate what's going on here. As it turns out, um, interviewers would go throughout the city um, working on behalf of the newspapers or on behalf of maybe progressive political elements, 
and they would interview the people who lived in these conditions. And in the course of these interviews, they interviewed a young lady, and they asked her really innocuous question, you know, what would you like to be when you grow up? And this young lady very famously said, I want to grow up to be a prostitute. Well, this was very shocking to the interviewer. And the interviewer said, well, what on earth are you talking about? You want to grow up to be a prostitute? Well, the young lady said, she explained, she was living in an apartment with 10 or 12 or 14 other people, her immediate family and the other people who were subletting part of the apartment. She said when she looked out the window, right across the alley, you know, less than 10 feet away, she could see into the window of the adjacent apartment. And in that adjacent apartment was a prostitute plying her trade. Well, when this woman got finished with her business appointment, uh, she would usher the man out, and then she had the entire apartment to herself. And the young lady explained that because she had this all this space... This prostitute had all of the space to herself. That's what she wanted to be a prostitute for because in her off time, she had an amazing amount of space that, that was hers and hers alone. Imagine, if you will, living in one of these apartment tenants, tenants, you have no privacy at all. And people do desire that. But you had to live close to the manufacturing place and you had no to commute. So you just pack people in. So there's this tremendous knock-on effect going on. In other words, society is really genuinely suffering through this overcrowding. So with that in mind, uh, let's go on to the, um, the next slide and talk about how labor, in other words, manufacturing cities, how that's actually working out. All right, what we're looking at in this slide is just a continuation of this idea really a twofold idea. Number one, progressivism is about trying to find ways that the law should catch up with industrialization. It has not, in the time frame we're talking about, that immediate post-Civil War era. And to make that law catch up with industrialization, we have to have a lot of stress in our society. We've already talked about farm. Let's talk about the stress on the industrial worker. Now, as I pointed out before, pay has not changed significantly in nearly 40 years, kind of beginning in the 1830s, 1840s, and now here we are in the 1860s, 1870s, and we've still got another 20 years to go. So let's take a look at the, at the photographs of which this is just a photo montage of many different photographs that I could have taken uh, to illustrate this point that industrial workers were under a lot of stress. Let's start with the lower left, that rather large photograph there, and if you look carefully uh, I think you'll find a whole lot of people in that photograph. So uh, kind of in the very lower left corner, you can see somebody's like legs and feet underneath a blanket, so that's one. And then beginning along the, uh, the far right edge, I guess the lower right and the, and the right edge, you can see another, there's one, two, three, four, five, I don't know, six, seven, eight people including the photo photographer, like nine people looking at you in this little tiny space. Sort of in the middle left, you can see the stove, and in front of that are all these guys' shoes, and on top of the stove are trunks and other, you know, um, living material uh, stacked on top, of the, on top of the stove. So these guys are really depending on body heat, really, to stay alive. Um, as I pointed out in the earlier photograph, living space is at an, at an extreme premium. So you have lots and lots of people packed into a tiny little space, and they're not being paid very well. They have to pay. They have to pool all their resources to stay in a place. You know, in a tiny little apartment in New York. Uh, in many ways, not much different from today. But this is a lot of stress in our society. These guys are factory workers, and they're working day and night, and day and night, and day and night. And then they have to spend what little money they make on a place to stay, which is, as you can see, is very, very substandard, and on food to eat, which is easy to get, it's plentiful, but it's also relatively expensive. So these guys are hungry and packed in to a land of in infinite space and tremendous amounts of food. So that's a big stress on society. Let's take a look at the photograph on the lower left. Here you have one, two, three, four, five women 
and they're packed into a little space and they're doing sewing. Okay, now we've kind of talked about this before, but let me reiterate. During the Civil War, one of the outcomes of the Civil War was standardized clothing. Everybody got used to that during the Civil War. Uh, you had all those uniforms being made and um, standardized clothing became uh, normal. That is to say, your clothing was no longer made at home by mom and dad on a piece-by-piece -piece basis. People got used to going to the store or looking into a Montgomery Wards or a Sears Robot catalog, finding the right size for their personal needs and ordering that to be made. Well, that's on the consumer side. Let's talk about the production side because we have to find the stress on the worker. Now, you find women entering into the labor force in huge numbers. During the 1830s, 1840s, uh, this is the beginning of the Second Great Awakening, and women were really put on a pedestal. So they were thought of as being just too, um, really too soft, too delicate to be in the workforce. But now, Civil War and the post-Civil War era, that thought process is long, long gone. And so middle class women, lower class women, they were in the workforce in big numbers. So let's put that again into practical application uh, in terms of like just something simple like shirt making. Everybody wanted to have their shirt factory made. Well, this is the factory. So a garment company would come up with a shirt design that was really, really popular. The right collar, the right cuff, all this other. And then they would say, okay, what we're going to do is get a bunch of women to make our shirts. And we will rent them the sewing machine. Uh, Sears had just uh, invented the sewing machine and made a lot of them, millions of them. Uh, if you go to any antique market, you're going to see a lot of these ancient old Sears uh, sewing machines. And they're all really expensive because so many millions were made. And they were really, really high quality. They lasted forever. So here in the foreground, you have this pedal push. Um, sewing machine, you had a treadle down below and you just push that with your feet and that turned a series of cranks and that turned the sewing machine. You rented this from the company. The company also gave you the patterns. Uh, they gave you, uh, they allowed you to like get the material, all the buttons, all the things that were going to go into their shirts. Then you took it home with all your, your buddies and you started sewing up all these machine, these shirts. Well, imagine, if you will, after a week, you've been working, 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 and you take these shirts back to the company, the garment company. And they say, okay, you've made 25 shirts. You know, we'll, we'll take these, and then these are substandard over here on inspection. So we're going to take 20, 23 of these, and you have 20, you've got two left that you've got to go fix up. And then the garment factory will say, okay, we're going to buy these 23, but out of that, you have to, like, pay rent on the sewing machine and you have to buy the material and you have to buy the buttons and so uh, out of that you actually only sold three or four shirts back to the company well you didn't make any money on that deal so you say okay well, we'll go one more week and you go back to your pals and you say okay this is all the money that we made for all the work that we did but, but what will actually happen is they'll say listen we're starving we gotta have food so they'll go 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 and the next week they come up with 35 shirts Okay, and two of those got rejected, and so they made a little bunny money on that one. Okay, and then the next week they're going to make a, they're going to go work all the harder. Now think of the garment company's side on this. Pretty soon, the sewing machines that they're renting will actually be paid for, and so all the extra rent money on the sewing machine and that's for free. That's just clear profit. They're getting the material really, really inexpensively because they're probably buying that wholesale and they're getting it really inexpensively. Same thing with the buttons. They only had to come up with a pattern one time and then just reproduce that. So that was really inexpensive. They're not paying for any shop space. All the piece work, which is what this is called, is done at home. So they're not paying for heating. They're not paying rent on a building. They're not paying, uh, you know, they don't have to wait for transportation costs. They don't have any of that. That's all on the women doing the piece work. So they're going like mad, giving these shirts, you know, constructing these shirts for very little money, and the quality is really, really high, and then they give them to the garment company. Now think again of your target market. This is all an economic language, and, and so think of your target market as the garment factory, as the garment manufacturer. Your target market is all those guys in the city and all of those people in the far west. In the far west, they have no manufacturing ability. 
they can't get manufactured cloth to turn into shirts in the West. So the shirts are made in the East really, really cheaply and then shipped to the West. Now again, we've already talked about this, but as a reminder, cargo space on a vessel is really, really inexpensive. All those ships, those clipper ships are in competition with one another. And made up shirts will actually sell very well. They, they ship very well. So you get some space on board a ship heading to the west and load all your shirts on there and then you have a retailer in the west marketing your shirts where no one has cloth to make their own shirts and they all want to buy handmade they all want to buy factory made shirts anyway so you can make them a lot of money on a deal like that you just pass the con the shipping costs on to the buyer and you can make a lot of money at, at that but you're not passing that on to the people who are doing the manufacturing, the actual workers, they're getting paid very, very little. And the garment factory is making a lot of money. So this is a big stress in society. Now, those top three photographs, uh, this is just child labor in the workforce. Um, if you'll take a look at those young men, what's happening here is that a chute is running kind of downhill between their legs and they're looking for spoil this is in a coal factory up up above so the coal is coming up out of the hole and it's going down the chutes and these young men are sitting on that bench that bar going across ways and they're sitting there uh, picking out the spoil picking out the big stuff picking out you know they're they're sorting the coal and you see the young fellow in behind there uh, along the far right edge of the photograph there he's got a bar and that bar kinda does two things if some big chunk of material tangles up the chute, tangles up the, the conveyor belt, he can hook that out with that bar. But more importantly, and there's many, many stories of this, if one of those young fellows should fall asleep or slip or get dragged down into that conveyor belt, that bar, he can take that bar and hook them out of it. And so you see one fellow there right along the right edge of the photograph, sort of on the upper edge, about halfway that's another fellow standing up next to the windows and so you have these guys walking up and down making sure that these really young boys don't simply fall into the coal chute and and get killed so it's really really dangerous work you're breathing in coal dust all the time you're being paid basically, basically 50 cents a day for a 14 15 hour work day in a really dangerous environment uh, these young men are all gonna die of black lung and you breathe in that coal dust, there's no way for your lungs to get rid of that stuff. So by the time they're 20 years old, they're dead or dying, okay? And so we're just exploiting that child labor force. Now the cartoons on the upper left and then the center left. This is what I want, what I always want to do with cartoons, which are becoming more and more popularized in the middle of the 19th century, is show you guys that people at the time knew what the problem was people knew what was going on people knew that there were big businessmen who were simply exploiting child labor you can see that with that fellow in that Roman looking chariot has got all these children harnessed up to his chariot and it says child labor exploiter people knew that at the time you see in the middle photograph all these big fat businessmen in all their top coats uh, really uh, kinda 1870s attire and standing on the auction block are basically these little starveling children and they're for sale to the highest bidder and so everybody knew at the time what was going on so seeing children in the labor force uh, seeing children exploited in this way exploiting your labor force left right and center the law has not caught up with industrialization but more importantly these are huge stresses in our society now on that note, uh, let's move on to the next slide. This is all that I've been talking about in this slide and the previous slide. This is on the macro. I'm sorry, on the micro. Now let's take a look at this on the macro. What we've seen right now is the micro. Let's transition and take a look at this, again in economic language, and we'll take a look at this on the macro. the macro now uh, what I've developed here is this slide that kind of is trying to convey to you the big picture 
So at the very top, we have a series of triangles here. And, and at the very top, that's the top 2% of the workforce. That is to say, the upper, upper level of management. And that small group of our population controls 90 to 98% of the wealth in this post-Civil War era. Okay, 1870s, 1880s, uh, really into the 1890s. We find the rich, and we've already